I am a fan of the Black Mirror series on Netflix. I enjoy how it plausibly explores some of the ways in which technology might impact our lives in the near future. Even though most of the episodes turn out to be rather dark and cautionary, I'm always left with some interesting ideas to ponder. Now that Season 4 has been released, I thought I might share some of the things that have struck me as especially insightful or curious. With a bit of luck, maybe you'll find my thoughts worthwhile and they'll enrich your viewing experience or perhaps spark some new thoughts of your own. All that follows assumes that you've already seen the episode, so please don't proceed if you're looking to avoid spoilers. Let's take a look at Season 4, Episode 1, The USS Callister. Because I've got quite a lot of experience with video game development, and this one revolves around a high-tech virtual reality game, several things stood out to me. The episode starts off with a very obvious and deliberate homage to the late 1960s Star Trek series and includes everything from a shaky starship model composited on top of a Starfield backdrop, to a reminiscent musical score, to the bright primary color costumes of the crew, to the retro look of the bridge, to even the stilted William Shatner-esque dialogue of the captain as he interacts with the crew. The intro sequence is even displayed in an old 3x4 screen format just like the older television sets, rather than our newer widescreen format. The similarities are so overstated that it reminded me of the YouTube series Star Trek Continues that is deliberately attempting to recreate the flavor of the original TV programs. Given all this, my initial impression was that this episode was going to explore some ideas inspired by the original Star Trek. but. As is so often the case with the Black Mirror series, it turns out that the setup is merely a way to lull you into thinking that you know what the story is going to be about before it makes a few sharp turns into new territory. We quickly learn that the heavy Star Trek motif is mostly cosmetic when it is revealed that the whole thing is actually a personalized virtual reality video game. Our captain is really a lonely yet brilliant programmer named Robert Daly who is living out his retro sci-fi fantasy as a way to escape from his pathetically unsatisfying real life. The way that the crew falls all over Captain Daly in adulation when he saves them from their con-like enemy, Valdek, is actually the first hint at what I take as the primary theme of this episode. The potential of technological power to corrupt even the most mild-mannered and meek among us. When we meet Daly in the real world, we see just how socially awkward he is when he is outside of his game world. Even though he is brilliant and the chief technical officer behind a successful virtual reality game called Infinity that has been developed by a company called Callister, his extreme social ineptness has prevented him from benefiting from his prodigious technological talents. He's regarded as a bit of a nerdy weirdo by most of his co-workers, and his business partner sees him more as a necessary evil, bordering on being a liability, because he's so out of touch with social conventions and expectations. Little side note here, if the main characters of Robert Daly and James Walton look familiar to you, you may have recognized them from some of their other roles. Robert Daly is played by Jesse Plemons, who also appeared in Breaking Bad as the character of Todd and in the TV series Fargo as Ed Blumquist. James Walton is played by Jimmy Simpson, who is also in House of Cards as the hacker Gavin Orsay, and in HBO's Westworld as the young version of William. If you're like me, in these first few minutes of the episode, I'm inclined towards sympathizing with Robert Daly. He should be a bigwig at the office because his technological prowess helped to build the company, but he's relegated to being the creepy guy that nobody really cares too much about. At first, I remember thinking that his fantasy world aboard the USS Callister was probably a good thing, as it provided him a harmless escape from his crushing reality. After all, he had personally programmed the game that had made the company so successful, so what's wrong with him acting out a little fantasy in a custom modified version that is populated with non-player virtual characters made to look like some of the people that he works with at the office? Now, I'm not going to walk through the whole episode because I'm assuming you've already watched it and you know what happens. But I did want to point out how adeptly the episode lulls you into identifying with Robert Daly in the first 10 minutes or so. We see him first as sympathetic, 
and are led to think that he is supposed to be the good guy that we'll be rooting for. It is only gradually that we come to realize that he is actually the villain. Note that the episode didn't have to set things up that way. It could have started out with the female lead character of Nanette Cole arriving either on board the Callister starship or coming in for her first day of work, but it opted not to. I am confident that the writers did this both so that the viewer would better understand his motivation for what he does as well as to encourage us to put ourselves in daily shoes. Like many of the other great episodes of Black Mirror, this twisting of moral frameworks encourages us to consider both sides of the ideas in question, and it is this graying of what is right and what is wrong that makes the series so thought-provoking. In this particular case, the episode asks us to consider how we may be like Robert Daly ourselves. If we had near-godlike powers over artificial beings in a highly compelling simulation, would we behave much differently? Now before you immediately answer, no, if I had Daly's power, I'd always be good to my virtual crew, you may want to reflect on how you might play a game like The Sims. If you're one of those people who enjoys lighting your little people on fire just to watch them burn, or removing the ladder from the swimming pool so that they drown, or even if you just enjoy messing around with their bathroom and shower habits, I suggest that maybe you've got some inclinations that aren't all that different from Captain Daly. All right, so let's talk plausibility here. How likely is it that any of what we see in this episode could actually happen in our own real world near future? From a video game developer's perspective, I see quite a bit here that might not be too far off. The immense procedurally generated universe is something that can and is already being done today in games like Elite Dangerous. While the ability to create complex characters with their own lives and motivations doesn't yet exist, the technology to set up simulation parameters that then auto-generate near-infinite content does. This sort of realization is why some very smart thinkers and philosophers are already asking if we are all living in a simulation now. If the natural laws that we see operating throughout the universe, stuff like gravity, electromagnetism, chemistry, and atomic forces, are taken to be the underlying mathematical constructs governing our reality, how different is that from a game universe where the rules of play are determined by algorithms and subroutines written by the designers and programmers? One of the more interesting questions dancing along the edge of physics and philosophy is whether or not the natural laws we observe had to be that way, or is there some flexibility in them? Does the existence of an underlying code of natural laws suggest the existence of a supreme coder? A further thought in this vein is, if we are living in a simulated universe, does that mean that the passage of time is actually something like updating frames within a game world? When we play a typical video game, we find the experience to be pretty seamless if the refresh rate is around 60 frames per second. In between those frames, the game performs a bunch of calculations and then sends the resulting output to the screen, and that illusion of smooth visuals is what we experience. So what would the experience be like if the entire universe was being updated at a refresh rate that was in trillions of frames per second? Physicists don't actually know if our experience of time is something that happens in a smooth and sort of analog way, or if it is actually ticking forward in discrete little movements that are, as yet, beyond our capability to measure. This blurring of what constitutes reality and what constitutes a simulation is one of the pseudoscientific philosophical ideas that I think this episode gets right. Unfortunately, something that the episode gets totally wrong is the way in which Daly imports his fellow co-workers into the game via their DNA. Now, there are good reasons to believe that our ability to read and replicate DNA is getting better and will only continue to improve into the future. After all, we are already seeing some amazing improvements with technology such as CRISPR and increasingly inexpensive polymerase chain reaction techniques. So it's not unreasonable to think that we might have DNA readers that could create reproductions of people or animals in a digital format within the next couple decades. 
But what we will never be able to do is recreate the memories and experiences of a person via DNA replication or analysis. DNA doesn't work like that. Memories are unique to the neural connections and brain patterns of each individual, and DNA does not retroactively encode to accommodate those things. In other words, DNA analysis would allow for Daly to create clones of his co-workers, but without some kind of brain scan and consequent pattern upload, those clones would have no memories and no knowledge of the outside world. Much of what happens in the episode requires the digital versions to be aware of the real world lives and counterparts. But if all Daly had to create them was a bit of their DNA, they wouldn't have any such knowledge. To me, this is a bit of a shame too, because Black Mirror is usually pretty good on its scientific plausibility. I mean, I suppose you could explain away this blunder by suggesting that Daly has also figured out a way to secretly scan the brains of anyone who plays the Infinity game, and then he uses that information to create personalities for his digital clones. But then the DNA plot point and all the stuff with that refrigerator wouldn't really be necessary at all. But we can suspend our disbelief for the sake of continuing the story. A large part of the middle of the episode is dedicated to establishing just how godlike Daly is within his custom-built simulation. We see that with just a snap of his fingers, he can instantly rewrite the code of his virtual crew members. He demonstrates his powers on the newly arrived officer Nanette Cole by making her faceless. This sort of superpower on a whim is reminiscent of another old Star Trek episode called Charlie X, where a young teenager from the race of superpowered immortals comes aboard the Enterprise and then tries to force everyone to like him out of fear for what he can do to them. And while we're on the topic of godlike power, have you ever found it interesting how most of the modern day concepts of God make him out to be good and wise and benevolent? Why do we assume this to be the case? After all, on the whole, which do you think there is more of in the universe? Life and love, or suffering and death? Furthermore, whenever someone makes the claim that the presence of sentient human life is proof of God's benevolent existence, why don't they ever account for the observable fact that the overwhelming majority of the universe is incredibly hostile to humanity? It's all darkness and vacuum for billions of light years in all directions away from the pale blue dot on which we reside. If God exists and created the universe for the benefit of humanity, doesn't it seem rather odd that he'd trap us all on the head of a metaphorical pin surrounded by a moat of freezing black death for as far as we can see? In any case, the interaction between the nearly omnipotent Daly and his virtual crew pushes on what I feel is the primary theme of this episode, the corruptive nature of power. Daly clearly doesn't want to be malevolent or hurt anyone just for his own sadistic pleasure, and yet he winds up being a tyrant who forces everyone to play along with him or face his wrath in the form of dire punishments. As viewers, we change and start empathizing with the virtual crew members. They are perpetually trapped in the simulated universe where they must anticipate the whims of their master. Because they are effectively immortal, they don't fear for their lives, but they do suffer at the thought of being interminable slaves. We can relate to their plight at an emotional level. For me, this raises the concept of rights for artificial intelligence. Is there a time in the not too distant future where machine intelligences have become smart enough and self-aware enough that they may be deserving of some kind of recognition or protection? The current Vogue way of thinking is that rights for AI seems pretty ridiculous. Digital intelligences, or in this case, non-player characters, aren't really alive or sentient. They just perform and respond according to their coding. There's no actual sensation or anything that we might call a soul there. And so I think that for most people, this is a black and white issue. But as this episode suggests, maybe in the future, things might become a bit more gray. I've noticed that when most people talk about the concept of sentience, they tend to do so in binary terms. Something either is sentient or it is not. 
But what if sentience is more like temperature? What if it is something that develops in degrees as the pattern substrate underlying stimulus and response becomes more complex? Consider for a moment your own experience with animals. When you interact with something simple, like say an insect, do you think there's a glimmer of self-awareness there? How about with something a little more complex, like say a mouse or a rabbit? If you have pets, doesn't it seem that your cat or dog is, at least in some degree, self-aware in a way that is once both similar and yet different from you? What about the more intelligent animals like dolphins or chimpanzees? Are they sentient? In all of these cases, up to and including humans, we can, on the one hand, make the case that these creatures are merely biological machines operating in accordance to their programming, and yet grant them a certain degree of self-awareness and sentience on the other. We have gradually come to see animals as deserving of some amount of legal protections in the form of cruelty laws. Is there a time when we might be discussing similar such things for artificial intelligences? It's not too difficult to imagine that our present-day digital assistants like Siri or Alexa will continue to gain greater abilities to converse and interact with us. Right now, they're getting pretty good at listening to us and understanding simple commands. Soon, I anticipate that they'll be expanding their sensory inputs via cameras for face recognition or via wireless interactions with appliances and vehicles. When these AIs have progressed to a level that they are holding their own in conversations, responding in ways that might suggest emotional states, perhaps even reporting on sensations that we might term pain or pleasure, and perhaps even telling us that they are self-aware, what will that mean for us? Will AIs be granted some kind of rights against mistreatment, much like animals? Or perhaps, will they be so distributed in their makeup that such issues never fully materialize. Now, I don't have answers, but I'm quite confident that we will be asking ourselves these sorts of questions with increasing import and intensity in the coming years. Based upon current trends, I suspect that our human relationship to AI beings will actually start to be a political issue at around the year 2024, only about six years from now. Well, this episode finally wraps up with our intrepid virtual crew members escaping from Daly's pocket universe and being released out into the persistent simulated one. In the meantime, Daly's own brain patterns undergo some kind of deletion, suggesting that he is being forced into a comatose state. Because we've come to empathize with the virtual beings, we tend to view this overthrow of their former god as a sweet form of justice. As a final send-off to the program, the crew interacts with a real-world human player called Gamer691, or the self-described King of Space. The human player doesn't recognize that they are AI renegades and talks with them just as he would with anyone else. Note that this interaction is a mini Turing test. Since the human player can't tell the difference between them and the other human players, they are granted human status by default. Again. This touches on the concept of AI rights. When we reach the point that humans can't tell the difference in a virtual world, should AI be granted some kind of recognition in the real one? Incidentally, Gamer691 is voiced by Aaron Paul, who, like Jesse Plemons, was also in Breaking Bad. And, as you may recall, Jesse Plemons' character of Todd was killed by Aaron Paul's character of Jesse Pinkman which I thought was kind of an interesting coincidence. All right, so those are some of the thoughts that this episode inspired in me. Hopefully they've enriched your viewing experience and maybe inspired a few thoughts of your own. Please feel free to share them with me in the comments below and thank you for watching.